Hello everyone, good evening, we're back again. More reading, more live reads from Aldous Huxley's short stories. And I'll say it's so lovely to see you all in the waiting room, I think it's called, or wh whatever it might be called, you know, waiting for the stream to start. So thanks everyone for being here, nice and prompt and waiting. I, I really appreciate that and it's always lovely to see you. Hello there, Samantha, Songbird, Shefki, and soul sister. Hello there everyone. Shefki is will be playing Tetris by the looks of it when I'm reading and I hope that I'll give you inspiration to hit your high score. Uh, and hello there Julie. Welcome. How are you? I hope you've had a, a nice pleasant start to the week. This story I couldn't find any information, any synopsis, but I could find a short quote and so that's what I'll read now briefly while we wait for everyone to join us who is able. It says here, um, In the Italian gardens of the 13th century, Mr. Buzzacott interrupted himself to take another helping of the risotto which was being offered him. Excellent risotto this, he observed. Nobody who was not born in Milan can make it properly. So they say, so they say, Mr. Topes repeated in his sad apologetic voice and helped himself in his turn. Personally, said Mr. Topes with decision, I find all Italian cooking abominable. I don't like the oil, especially hot. No, thank you. She recoiled from the preferred dish. Okay, so I don't know from the from the title and that, I mean, green tunnels, it could be something to do with envy or jealousy. Of course, it could be something to do with the color green and there's literally a green tunnel somewhere, but I don't think um, Aldous Huxley goes for that simple stuff. So I imagine it's something to do like green with envy. Uh, we see it's set in Italy and uh, we'll find out very shortly. And uh, hello there, Diamond Painter. And I don't know about this name. Rexlin, I'm going to go for. Finally caught a live stream. I love all your audiobooks and they are so pleasant to fall asleep to. Rexlin, hello. I'm glad you could make it to one of these lives and join us. And I'm glad that my voice helps you to fall asleep. I think many people if they're not here enjoying the great stories, they maybe just have my voice on to uh, drift off to sleep. It's something that I did when I was much younger. I had books on tape. There was no YouTube when I was a young man, but my mum had uh, the books on tape. I've actually shared them all over on the Lewis Kirk um, channel. Uh, what would they be under? What's the thing called? Um, classical stories and fairy tales, I think. And so, yes, I used to enjoy drifting off to sleep to whoever that narrator was, but I'm happy that I helped you get off to sleep. And so, yeah, without further ado, oh no, actually, as always, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and maybe consider sharing the show on your socials. If you've got a, a large, large social media following, that would help very much, but... Slow and steady is fine also. Here we go. And just say thanks everyone for joining. And let's get into this. Green Tunnels by Aldous Huxley. In the Italian gardens of the 13th century, Mr. Buzzacott interrupted himself to take another helping of the risotto which was being offered him. Excellent risotto this, he observed. Nobody who was not born in Milan can make it properly, so they say. And it appears, and it turns out that this was the quote that I shared. It's actually the beginning of the story. <laughs> so they say, Mr. Topes repeated in his sad, apologetic voice, and helped himself in his turn. Personally, said Mr. Topes with decision, I find all Italian cooking abominable. I don't like the oil, especially hot. No, thank you. She recoiled from the preferred dish, and that's Mrs. Tope, so not Mr. Tope's. <laughs> I'm glad I helped you get off to sleep as well, Matilda. Oh, sorry, Samantha Matilda Kramer. That's, uh, like I say, 
multiple layers and levels going on here at Book Club, so whatever suits you, that's fine with me. After the first mouthful, Mr. Buzzacott put down his fork. In the Italian gardens of the 13th century, he began again, making with his long, pale hand a curved and flowery gesture that ended with a clutch at his beard. A frequent and most felicitous use was made of green tunnels. Hmm. Yes, my dear, said her father, green tunnels, arched alleys covered with vines or other creeping plants. Their length was very considerable. But Barbara had once more ceased to pay attention to what he was saying. Green tunnels. The words had floated down to her through profound depths of the reverie, across great spaces of abstraction, startling her like the sound of a strange-voiced bell. Green tunnels. What a wonderful idea. She would not listen to her father explaining the phase, the phrase into dullness. He made everything dull an inverted alchemist, turning gold into lead. <laughs> I like that one. We should all try and use that in our lives. An inverted alchemist, trying to turn gold into lead. She pictured caverns in a great aquarium, long vistas between rocks and scarcely swaying weeds and pale, discoloured corals, endless dim green corridors with huge, lazy fishes loitering aimlessly along them. Green-faced monsters with goggling eyes and mouths that slowly opened and shut. Green tunnels. I have seen them illustrated and illuminated manuscripts of the period Mr. Buzzacott went on. Once more he clutched his pointed brown beard, clutched and combed it with his long fingers. Mr. Topes looked up. The glasses of his round, owlish spectacles flashed as he moved his head. I know what you mean, he said. I have a very good mind to have one planted in my garden here. It will take a long time to grow, said Mr. Topes. In this sand, so close to the sea, you will only be able to plant vines, and they come up very slowly, very slowly indeed. He shook his head, and the points of light danced wildly in his spectacles. His, his voice drooped hopelessly, his grey moustache drooped, his whole person drooped. Then suddenly he pulled himself up. A shy, apologetic smile appeared on his face. He wriggled uncomfortably. Then, with a final, rapid shake of the head, he gave vent to a quotation. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. He spoke deliberately, and his voice trembled a little. He always found it painfully difficult to say something choice and out of the ordinary, and yet what a wealth of remembered phrase! What apt new coinages were always surging through his mind! They don't grow so slowly as all that, said Mr. Buzzacott confidently. He was only just over fifty and looked a handsome thirty-five. He gave himself at least another forty years. Indeed, he had not yet begun to contemplate the possibility of ever concluding. Miss Barbara will enjoy it, perhaps, your green tunnel, Mr. Tope sighed and looked across the table at his host's daughter. Barbara was sitting with her elbows on the table, her chin in her hands, staring in front of her. The sound of her own name reached her faintly. She turned her head in Mr. Topes's direction and found herself confronted by the glitter of his round, convex spectacles. At the end of the green tunnel she stared at the shining circles, hung the eyes of the goggling fish. They approached, floating closer and closer along the dim submarine corridor. Confronted by this fixed regard, Mr. Topes looked away. What thoughtful eyes! He couldn't remember ever to have seen eyes so full of thought. There were certain Madonnas of Montagna, he reflected, very like her, mild little blonde Madonnas with slightly snub noses and very, very young. But he was old. It would be many years, in spite of Buzzacott, before the vines grew up into a green tunnel. He took a sip of wine, then mechanically sucked his drooping grey moustache. Arthur! At the sound of his wife's voice, Mr. Tope started, raised his napkin to his mouth. Mrs. Topes did not permit the sucking of moustaches. It was only in moments of absent-mindedness that he ever offended now. <laughs> like me, diamond painter. <laughs> I'm a hundred and twelve, if you didn't know. <laughs> I've got the Taoist, um, Taoist long life longevity practices that I practice.
<clears throat> the Marchi's Prampolini is coming here to take coffee, said Mr. Buzzacott suddenly. I almost forgot to tell you. One of these Italian marquises, I suppose, said Mr. Topes, who was no snob except in England. She raised her chin with a little jerk. Mr. Buzzacott executed an upward curve of the hand in her direction. I assure you, Mrs. Topes, he belongs to a very old and distinguished family. They are Genoa Genoese in origin. You remember their palace, Barbara, built by Alessi? Barbara looked up. Oh, yes, she said vaguely. Alessi, I know. Alessi, Aleppo, where a malignant and turbaned Turk and a turban that had always seemed to her very funny. Several of his ancestors, Mr. Buzzacott went on, distinguished themselves as viceroys of Corsica. They did good work in the suppression of rebellion. Strange, isn't it? He turned parenthetically to Mr. Topes, the way in which sympathy is always on the side of rebels. What a fuss people made of Corsica. That ridiculous book by Gregorovius, for example, and the Irish and the Poles and all the rest of them. It always seems to me very superfluous and absurd. "'Isn't it, perhaps, a little natural?' Mr. Topes began timorously and tentatively, but his host went on without listening. "'The present Marquis,' he said, "'is the head of the local fascisti. "'They have done no end of good work in this district "'in the way of preserving law and order "'and keeping the lower classes in their place.' "'Ah, the fascisti,' Mr. Topes repeated approvingly. "'One would like to see something of the kind in England. "'What with all, this, what with all these strikes?' He has asked me for a subscription to the funds of the organisation. I shall give him one, of course. Of course, Mr. Topes nodded. My nephew, the one who has a major, who was a major during the war, volunteered in the last coal strike. He was sorry, I know, that he didn't come to a fight. Aunt Annie, he said to me when I saw him last, if there had been a fight, we should have knocked them out completely, completely. In Aleppo, the fascisti, malignant and turbaned, were fighting under the palm trees. Weren't they palm trees, those tufted green plumes? What? No ice today? Niente gelato? inquired Mr. Buzzacott as the maid put down the, com the compote of peaches on the table. Conchetta apologised. The ice-making machine in the village had broken down. There would be no ice till tomorrow. Too bad, said Mr. Buzzacott. Troppo male. Conocetta or Conchetta. Under the palm trees, Barbara saw them. They pranced about, fighting. They were mounted on big dogs, and in the trees were enormous many-coloured birds. Goodness me, the child's asleep, Mr. Topes was proffering the dish of peaches. How much longer am I to hold this in front of your nose, Barbara? Barbara felt herself blushing. I'm so sorry, she mumbled and took the dish clumsily. Daydreaming, it's a bad habit. "'It's one we all succumb to sometimes,' put in Mr. Topes deprecatingly, with a little nervous tremble of the head. "'You may, my dear,' said his wife. "'I do not.' Mr. Topes lowered his eyes to his plate and went on eating. "'The Marquis should be here at any moment now,' said Mr. Buzzacott, looking at his watch. "'I hope he won't be late. I find I suffer so much from any postponement of my siesta.' This Italian heat, he added, with growing plaintiveness, one can't be too careful. Ah, but when I was with my father in India, began Mrs. Topes in a tone of superiority, he was an Indian civilian, you know. Aleppo, India, always the palm trees, cavalcades of big dogs, and tigers too. Conchetta ushered in the Marquis, delighted, pleased to meet Pleased to meet. Speak English? Yes, yes, Pochino. Mrs. Topes and Mr. Topes, the distinguished antiquarian. Ah, of course, know his name very well. My daughter, charmed, often seen the, sin the signorina bathing. Admired the way she dives. Beautiful. The hand made a long, caressing gesture. These athletic English signorin. The teeth falsely flashed astonishingly white in the brown face. The dark eyes glittered. She felt herself blushing again, looked away, smiled foolishly. The Marquis had already turned back to Mr. Buzzacott. So you have decided to settle in our Carraris? Well, not settled exactly. Mr. Buzzacott wouldn't go so far as to say settled. 
Avellino for the summer months, the winter in Rome. One was forced to live abroad, taxation in England. Soon they were all talking. Barbara looked at them. Beside the Marquis they all seemed half dead. His face flashed as he talked. He seemed to be boiling with life. Her father was limp and pale, like something long buried from the light and Mr. Topes was all dry and shriveled, and Mrs. Topes looked more than ever like something worked by clockwork. They were talking about socialism and fascisti and all that. Barbara did not listen to what they were saying, but she looked at them, absorbed. Goodbye, goodbye. The animated face, with its flash of a smile, was turned like a lamp from one to another. Now it was turned on her. Perhaps one evening she would come with her father and the Signora Topes. He and his sister gave little dances sometimes, only the gramophone, of course, but that was better than nothing, and the Signorina must dance divinely. Another flash, he could see that. He pressed her hand again. Goodbye. It was time for the siesta. Don't forget to pull down the mosquito netting, my dear, Mr. Buzzacott exhorted. There is always a danger of... A, of Anophilines, anophilines, don't know that word. All right, father, she moved towards the door without turning round to answer him. He was always terribly tiresome about mosquito nets. Once they had driven through the campagna in a hired cab, completely enclosed in an improvised tent of netting. The monuments along the Appian Way had loomed up mistily as through bridal veils and how everyone had laughed, but her father, of course, hadn't so much as noticed it. He never noticed anything. Is it at Berlin, that charming little Madonna of Montagnas? Mr. Topes abruptly asked, the one with the donor kneeling in the left-hand corner as if about to kiss the foot of the child. His spectacles flashed in Mr. Buzzacott's direction. Why do you ask? I don't know. I was just thinking of it. I think you must mean the one in Mon, in Mon, in the Mon collection. Ah, yes, very probably in the Mon. Barbara opened the door and walked into the twilight of her shuttered room. It was hot even here. For another three hours it would hardly be possible to stir, and that old idiot, Mr. Topes, always made a fuss if one came in to lunch with bare legs and one's after-bathing tunic. In India we always made a point of being properly and adequately dressed. An Englishwoman must keep up her position with natives, and to all intents and purposes Italians are natives. And so she always had to put on shoes and stockings and a regular frock just at the hottest hour of the day. What an old ass that woman was. She slipped off her clothes as fast as she could. That was a little better. Standing in front of the long mirror in the wardrobe door, she came to the humiliating conclusion that she looked like a piece of badly toasted bread. Brown face, brown neck and shoulders, brown arms, brown legs from the knee downwards. But all the rest of her was white, silly, effeminate, townish white. If only one could run about with no clothes on till one was like those little coppery children who rolled and tumbled in the burning sand. Now she was just underdone, half-baked, and wholly ridiculous. For a long time she looked at her pale image. She saw herself running bronzed all over along the sand, or through a field of flowers, narcissus or wild tulips, or in soft grass under grey olive trees. She turned round with a sudden start. There, in the shadows behind her, no. Oh. <clears throat> There, in the shadows behind her, no, of course there was nothing. It was that awful picture in a magazine she had looked at so many years ago when she was a child. There was a lady sitting at her dressing table doing her hair in front of the glass, and a huge, hairy, black monkey creeping up behind her. She always got the creeps when she looked at herself in the mirror. It was very silly, but still. She turned away from the mirror, crossed the room, and, without lowering the mosquito curtains, lay down on her bed. The flies buzzed about her, settled incessantly on her face. She took her head, flapped at them angrily with her hands. There would, there would be peace if she let down the netting. But she thought of the Appian Way seen mistily through the bridal veil, and preferred to suffer the flies. In the end she had to surrender. The brutes were too much for her. But at any rate it wasn't the fear of anophelines that made her lower the netting. <laughs> ...or 
Undisturbed now and motionless, she lay stretched stiffly out under the transparent bell of gauze. A specimen under a glass case. The fancy possessed her mind. She saw a huge museum with thousands of glass cases full of fossils and butterflies and stuffed birds and medieval spoons and armour and Florentine jewellery and mummies and carved ivory and illuminated manuscripts. But in one of the cases was a human being shut up there alive. All of a sudden she became horribly miserable. Boring, 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 she whispered, formulating the words aloud. Would it never stop being boring? The tears came into her eyes. How awful everything was. And perhaps it would go on being as bad as this all her life. Seventeen from seventy was fifty-three. Fifty-three years of it. And if she lived to a hundred, there would be more than eighty. The thought depressed her all the evening. Even her bathe after tea did her no good. Swimming far out, far out, she lay there, floating on the warm water. Sometimes she looked at the sky, sometimes she turned her head towards the shore. Framed in their pine wood, the villas looked as small and smug as the advertisement of, the, of a seaside resort. But behind them, across the level plain, were the mountains, sharp, bare peaks of limestone, green woodland slopes and grey-green expanses of terraced olive trees. They seemed marvellously close and clear in that evening light, and beautiful, beautiful beyond words. But that somehow only made things worse, and Shelley had lived a few miles farther up the coast, there behind the headland guarding the Gulf of Spezia. Shelley had been drowned in this milk-warm sea. That made it worse, too. The sun was getting very low and red over the sea. She swam slowly in. On the beach, Mrs. Topes waited disapprovingly. She had known somebody, a strong man, who had caught cramp from staying in too long. He sank like a stone, like a stone, the queer people Mrs. Topes had known, and the funny things they did, the odd things that happened to them. Dinner that evening was duller than ever. Barbara went early to bed. All night long the same old irritating cicada scraped and scraped among the pine trees, monotonous and regular as clockwork. Zip, 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 zip. Boring, boring. Was the animal never bored by its own noise? It seemed odd that it shouldn't be, but, when she came to think of it, nobody ever did, did get bored with their own noise. Mrs. Topes, for example, she never seemed to get bored. Zip, 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 the cicada went on without a pause. Conchetta knocked at the door at half-past seven. The morning was as bright and cloudless as all the mornings were. Barbara jumped up, looked from one window at the mountains, from the other at the sea. All seemed to be well with them. All was well with her, too, this morning. Seated at the mirror, she did not so much as think of the big monkey in the far obscure corner of the room. A bathing dress and a bath gown, sandals, a handkerchief round her head, and she was ready. Sleep had left no recollection of last night's mortal, bed, mortal boredom. She ran downstairs. Good morning, Mr. Topes. Mr. Topes was walking in the garden among the vines. He turned round, took off his hat, smiled a greeting. Good morning, Miss Barbara, he paused. Then, with an embarrassing wriggle of introduction, he went on. A queer little falter came into his voice. A real Chaucerian morning, Miss Barbara. A May Day morning. Only it happens to be September. Nature is fresh and bright, and there is at least one specimen in this dream garden. He wriggled more uncomfortably than ever, and there was a tremulous glitter in his round spectacled lenses of the poet's young fresh folks. He bowed in her direction, smiled deprecatingly, and was silent. The remark, it seemed to him, now that he had finished speaking, was somehow not as good as he thought it would be. Barbara laughed. Chaucer? They used to make us read the Canterbury Tales at school, but they always bored me. Are you going to bathe? Not before breakfast, Mr. Tope shook his head. One is getting a little too old for that. Is one? Why did this silly old man always say one when he meant I? She couldn't help laughing at him. Well, I must hurry or else I shall be late for breakfast again, and you know how I catch it. She ran out through the gate in the garden wall across the beach to the striped red and white bathing cabin that stood before the house. Fifty yards away she saw the Marchese Pam the Marchese Prampolini, 
still dripping from the sea, running up towards his bathing hut. Catching sight of her, he flashed a smile in her direction, gave a military salute. Barbara waved her hand, then thought that the gesture had been a little too familiar, but at this hour of the morning it was difficult not to have bad, jolly manners, and added the corrective of a stiff bow. After all, she had only met him yesterday. Soon she was swimming out to sea, and ugh, what a lot of horrible, huge jellyfish there were. <clears throat> Mr. Topes had followed her slowly through the gate and across the sand. He watched her running down from the cabin, slender as a boy, with long, bounding strides. He watched her go jumping with great splashes through the deepening water, then throw herself forward and began to swim. He watched her till she was more than a small, dark dot far out. Emerging from his cabin, the Marquis met him walking slowly along the beach, his head bent down and his lips slightly moving as though he were repeating something, a prayer or a poem to himself. "'Good morning, signor. The Marquis shook him by the hand with the more than English cordiality. "'Good morning,' replied Mr. Topes, allowing his hand to be shaken. He resented the interruption of his thoughts. "'She swims very well, Miss Buzzacott.' "'Very,' assented Mr. Topes, and smiled to himself to think what beautiful, poetical things he might have said if he had chosen. "'Well, so-so,' said the Marquis, too colloquial by half. He shook hands again, and the two men went their respective ways.' Barbara was still a hundred yards from the shore when she heard the crescendo and dying boom of the gong floating out from the villa. Damn! She'd be late again. She quickened her stroke and came splashing out through the shallows, flushed and breathless. She'd be ten minutes late, she calculated. It would take her at least that to do her hair and dress. Mrs. Topes would be on the warpath again, though what business that old woman had to lecture her as she did, goodness only knew. She always succeeded in making herself horribly offensive and unpleasant. <clears throat> hey, King Arjun, welcome. The beach was quite deserted as she trotted, panting across it, empty to right and left as far as she could see. If only she had a horse to go galloping at the water's edge, miles and miles. <laughs> we don't know yet, but uh, it could be green tunnels, but we're finding out. Right away, down to Bocodano she'd go, swim the river. She saw herself crouching on the horse's back as she swam, with legs tucked up on the saddle, trying not to get her feet wet, and gallop on again, goodness only knew where. In front of the cabin she suddenly halted. There, in the ruffled sand, she had seen writing, big letters, faintly legible, sprawled across her path. O Clara Dele Buisi. Sorry about my pronunciation. She pieced the dim letters together. They hadn't been there when she started out to bathe. Who? She looked around. The beach was quite empty. And what was the meaning? O Clara Dele Buisi. She took her bath gown from the cabin, slipped on her sandals, and ran back towards the house as fast as she could. She felt most horribly frightened. It was a sultry, headachy sort of morning, with a hot sicaro that stirred the bunting on the flagstaffs. By midday the thunderclouds had covered half the sky. The sun still blazed on the sea, but over the mountains all was black and indigo. The storm broke noisily overhead, just as they were drinking their after-luncheon coffee. Arthur, said Mrs. Topes, painfully calm, shut the shutters, please. She was not frightened, no, but she preferred not to see the lightning. When the room was darkened, she began to talk, suavely and incessantly. Lying back in her deep armchair, Barbara was thinking of Clara de la Buisse. What did it mean, and who was Clara de la Buisse? And why had he written it there for her to see? He, for there, could be no doubt who had written it. The flash of teeth and eyes, the military salute. She knew she oughtn't to have waved to him. He had written it there while she was swimming out, written it and then run away. She rather liked that, just an extraordinary word on the sand, like the footprint in Robinson Crusoe. Personally, Mr. Mrs. Topes was saying, I prefer Harrods. The thunder crashed and rattled. It was rather exhilarating, Barbara thought. One felt, at any rate, 
that something was happening for a change. She remembered the little room halfway up the stairs at Lady Thingamy's house, with the bookshelves and the green curtains. <clears throat> and the green curtains and the orange shade on the light and that awful young man, like a white slug, who had tried to kiss her there at the dance last year. But, there was di but that was different, not at all serious, and the young man had been so horribly ugly. She saw the Marquis running up the beach, quick and alert, copper-coloured all over with black hair. He was certainly very handsome. But as for being in love, well, what did that exactly mean? Perhaps when she knew him better. Even now she fancied, fancied she detected something. Oh, Clara de la Buisse. What an extraordinary thing it was. And again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that at all right, but I'm trying my best. <clears throat> With his long fingers, Mr. Buzzacott combed his beard. This winter, he was thinking, he would put another thousand into Italian money when the exchange was favourable. In the spring, it always seemed to drop back again. One could clear three hundred pounds on one's capital in the if the exchange went down to seventy. The income on the three hundred was fifteen pounds a year, and fifteen pounds was now fifteen hundred lira. And fifteen hundred lira, when you came to think of it, was really sixty pounds. That was to say that one would make an addition of more than a pound a week to one's income by this simple little speculation. He became aware that Mrs. Topes had asked him a question. <laughs> yes, yes, perfectly, he said. Mrs. Topes talked on. She was keeping up her morale. Was she right in believing that the thunder sounded a little less alarmingly loud and near? Mr. Tope sat, polishing his spectacles with a white silk handkerchief, vague and myopic between their puckered lids. His eyes seemed lost, homeless, unhappy. He was thinking about beauty. There were certain relations between the eyelids and the temples, between the breasts and the shoulder. There were certain successions of sounds. But what about them? Ah, that was the problem, that was the problem, and there was youth, there was innocence, but it was all very obscure, and there were so many phrases, so many remembered pictures and melodies, he seemed to get himself entangled among them, and he was so old and ineffective. <laughs> Is that true then, Shefki, Italians much like Spanish? He put on his spectacles again, and definition came into the foggy world beyond his eyes. The shuttered room was very dark. He could distinguish the Renaissance profile of Mr. Buzzacott, bearded and delicately featured. In her deep armchair, Barbara appeared, faintly white, in an attitude relaxed and brooding. And Mrs. Topes was nothing more than a voice in the darkness. She had got on to the marriage of the Prince of Wales. Who would they find for him? Clara de la Buse, Clara de la Buse, she saw herself so clearly as the Marchesa. They would have a house in Rome, a palace. She saw herself in Palazzo Spada. It had such a lovely vaulted passage leading from the courtyard to the gardens at the back. Marchesa Prampolini, Palazzo Spada, Roma. A great big visiting card, beautifully engraved, and she would go riding every day in the Pincio. Mi porta... Il mio cavallo, she would say to the footman who answered the bell, Porta, would that be quite correct? Hardly. She'd have to take some proper Italian lessons to talk to the servants. One must never be ridiculous before servants. Voglio il mio cavallo. Haughtily, one would say, sitting at one's riding table in a riding habit without turning round. It would be a green riding habit with a black tricorn hat braided with silver. <clears throat> yes, yeah, she, she does like to, um, she likes to have a daydream, it seems. Barbara, Barbara is often daydreaming, even um, as far as we've come. Sounds like a boring life she leads, though, with all those um, older folks. Prendero la mia calazione a letto. 
Was that right for breakfast in bed? Because she would have breakfast in bed always, and when she got up there would be lovely looking glasses with three panels where one could see oneself side-faced. She saw herself leaning forward, pondering her nose, powdering her nose even, carefully, scientifically, with the monkey creeping up behind. Ooh, horrible. Ho pora di questa simia questo simione. She would come back to lunch after her ride. Perhaps Prampolini would be there. She had rather left him out of the picture so far. Dove il marchese? Nella sala di pranza, signora. I began without you. I was so hungry. Pasta, pasta asciutta. Where have you been, my love? Riding, my dove? She supposed they'd get into the habit of saying that sort of thing. Everyone seemed to. And you? I have been out with the fascisti. Oh, these fascisti! Would life be worth living when he was always going out with pistols and bombs and things? They would bring him back one day on a stretcher. She saw it, pale, pale, with blood on him. Il signor è ferito nel petto, gravemente e morto. How could she bear it? It was too awful, too, too terrible. Her breath came in a kind of sob. She, sh she shuddered as, th as though she had been hurt. E morto. Immorto. The tears came into her eyes. She was roused suddenly by a dazzling light. The storm had receded far enough into the distance to permit of Mrs. Tope's opening the shutters. It's quite stopped raining. To be disturbed in one's intimate sorrow and self-abandonment at a deathbed by a stranger's intrusion, an alien voice, Barbara turned her face away from the light and surreptitiously wiped her eyes. They might see and ask her why she had been crying. She hated Mrs. Topes for opening the shutters. At the inrush of the light something beautiful had flown, an emotion had vanished, irrecoverably, or irrecoverably. <laughs> I'm going to say irrecoverably irrecoverably. It was a sacrilege. Mr. Buzzacott looked at his watch. Too late, I fear, for a siesta now, he said. Suppose we ring for an early tea? An endless succession of meals, said Mr. Topes with a tremolo and a sigh. That's what life seems to be, real life. I have been calculating, Mr. Buzzacott turned his pale green eyes towards his guest, that I may be able to afford that pretty little quinque cassone after all. It would be a bit of a squeeze, he played with his beard, but still. After tea, Barbara and Mr. Topes went for a walk along the beach. She didn't much want to go, but Mrs. Topes thought it would be good for her, so she had to. The storm had passed and the sky over the sea was clear. But the waves were still breaking with an incessant clamour on the outer shallows, driving wide sheets of water high up the beach, twenty or thirty yards above the line where, on a day of calm, the ripples ordinarily expired. Smooth, shining expanses of water advanced and receded like steel surfaces moved out and back by a huge machine. Through the rain-washed air the mountains appeared with an incredible clarity, Above them hung huge masses of cloud. Clouds over Carrara, said Mr. Topes, deprecating his mark with a little shake of the head and a movement of the shoulders. I like to fancy sometimes that the spirits of the great sculptors lodge among these marble hills, and that it is their unseen hands that carve the clouds into these enormous splendid shapes. I imagine they're ghosts. His voice trembled, feeling about among superhuman conceptions, planning huge groups and phrases and monumental figures with blowing draperies, planning, conceiving, but never quite achieving. Look, there's something of Michelangelo in that white cloud with the dark shadow underneath it. Mr. Topes pointed, and Barbara nodded and said, Yes, yes, though she wasn't quite sure which cloud he meant. It's like night on the Medici tomb. All the power and the passion are brooding inside it, pent up. And there, in that sweeping, gesticulating piece of vapour, you see the one I mean? There's a barini, or sorry, a... All the passions on the surface expressed, the gestures caught at its most violent, and that sleek, smug white fellow over there, that's a delicious, observed canova. Mr. Topes chuckled. Why do you always talk about art? said Barbara. You bring these dead people into everything. 
What do I know about Canova or whoever he is? There were none of them alive, she thought of that dark face, bright as a lamp with life. He at least wasn't dead. She wondered whether the letters were still there in the sand before the cabin. No, of course not. The rain and the wind would have blotted them out. Mr. T Mr. Topes was silent. He walked with slightly bent knees and his eyes were fixed on the ground. He wore a speckled black and white straw hat. He always thought of art. That was what was wrong with him. Like an old tree he was, built up of dead wood, with, with only a few fibres of life to keep him from rotting away. They walked on for a long time in silence. Here's the river, said Mr. Topes at last. A few steps more and they were on the bank of a wide stream that came down slowly through the plain to the sea. Just inland from the beach it was fringed with pine trees. Beyond the trees one could see the plain, and beyond the plain were the mountains. In this calm light after the storm everything looked strange. The colours seemed deeper and more intense than at ordinary times, and though all was so clear there was a mysterious air of remoteness about the whole scene. There was no sound except the continuous breathing of the sea. They stood for a little while, looking, then turned back. Far away along the beach two figures were slowly approaching, white flannel trousers, a pink skirt. Nature, Mr. Topes enunciated, with a shake of the head. One always comes back to nature. At a moment such as this, in surroundings like these, one realises it. One lives now, more quietly perhaps, but more profoundly. Deep waters, deep waters. The figures drew closer. Wasn't it the Marquis? And who was with him? Barbara strained her eyes to see. Most of one's life, Mr. Topes went on, is one prolonged effort to prevent oneself thinking. Your father and I, we collect pictures and read about the dead. Other people achieve the same result by drinking or breeding rabbits or doing amateur carpentry. Anything rather than think calmly about the important things. Mr. Topes was silent. He looked about him at the sea, at the mountains, at the great clouds, at his companion. A frail montagna madonna with the sea and the westering sun, the mountains and the storm, all eternity as a background. And he was sixty, with all a life immensely long and yet timelessly short behind him, an empty life. He thought of death and the miracles of beauty behind his round, glittering spectacles. He felt inclined to weep. The approaching couple were quite were quite near now. What a funny old walrus, said the lady. Walrus? Your natural history is quite wrong. The Marquis laughed. He's much too dry to be a walrus, I suggest. Some sort of an old cat. Well, whatever he is, I'm sorry for that poor little girl. Think of having nobody better to go about with. Pretty, isn't she? Yes, but too young, of course. I like the innocence. Innocence? Cher ami. These English girls, ooh la la. They may look innocent, but believe me. Shh, shh, they'll hear you. Pooh, they don't understand Italian. The Marquis raised his hand. The old warus, he whispered, then addressed himself loudly and jovially to the newcomers. Good evening, Signora. Good evening, Mr. Topes. After a storm, the air is always the purest, don't you find, eh? Barbara nodded, leaving Mr. Topes to answer. It wasn't his sister. It was the Russian woman, the one of whom Mr. Mrs. Topes used to say that it was a disgrace she should be allowed to stay at the hotel. She had turned away, dissociating herself from the conversation. Barbara looked at the line of her averted face. Mr. Topes was saying something about the pastoral symphony, purple face powder in the daylight. It looked hideous. Well, au revoir. The flash of the Marquis's smile was directed at them. The Russian woman turned back from the sea, slightly bowed, smiled languidly. Her heavy white eyelids were almost closed. She seemed the prey of an enormous ennui, or ennui. They jar a little, said Mr. Topes, when they are out of earshot. They jar on the time, on the place, on the emotion. They haven't the innocence for this. This, he wriggled and trembled and out the just, oh, sorry, <clears throat> he wriggled and trembled out the just, the all too precious word, this prelapsarian landscape. He looked sideways at Barbara and wondered what she was so thoughtfully frowning over. Oh, lovely and delicate young creature, what could he adequately say of death and beauty and tenderness? Tenderness. 
All this, he went on desperately, and waved his hand to indicate the sky, the sea, the mountains. This scene is like something remembered, clear and utterly calm, remembered across great gulfs of intervening time. But that was not really what he wanted to say. You see what I mean? he asked dubiously. She made no reply. How could she see? This scene is so clear and pure and remote. You need the corresponding emotion. Those people were out of harmony. They weren't clear and pure enough. He seemed to be getting more muddled than ever. It's an emotion of the young and of the old. You could feel it. I could feel it. Those people couldn't. He was feeling his way through obscurities. Where would he finally arrive? Certain poems express it. You know Francis James? I have thought so much of his work lately, art instead of life as usual, but then I made that way. I can't help thinking of jams, those delicate, exquisite things he, wo he wrote about Clara de la Busse. Clara de la Busse? She stopped and stared at him. You know the lines. Mrs. Tope smiled delightedly. This place makes me think. You make me think of them. J'aime dans les temps, Clara de la Busse. But my dear Barbara, what is the matter? She had started crying for no reason whatsoever. The end. Well, I'm not sure if that story had any <laughs> any meaning or ending whatsoever. I uh, maybe you guys are always very good at um, always good at interpreting the the meanings of the story. Obviously, at the beginning, there was a reference to green tunnels. And Barbara was daydreaming, and that bit at the end there. Hello there, Sonia. Welcome. Uh, yes, I'm afraid it's just uh, we're just finishing up, so you can watch it on replay after if you like. But yeah, I'll be honest with you. There's probably better books to re-listen to if I'm honest. But I mean, it, it seems that she thought or. Someone had written Clara de la Brousse in the in the sand, and she assumed. Uh, yeah, me too, Julie, and I think, I think it's okay to to speak honestly about it, right? There's no point in pretending, and trying to make it what it wasn't. It was what it was, right? And that's what we're trying. I'm trying to find some uh, some good points in it, but, yeah. It wasn't the best story I've ever read in my life, and I wouldn't recommend it to someone. This wouldn't be the um, the link that I share on my socials to say, come to book club, because <laughs> if people aren't too keen on reading anyway, and they come in and read uh, Green Tunnels, they'll be like, is that what books are nowadays? Blimey, that's, that's rubbish. <laughs> But yes, clearly a big part of it was Barbara. She has a boring life. She likes to daydream about romance. There's this Marquis chap who she thought maybe he'll fall in love with me and give me some excitement in my life. She saw this um, Clara de la Brousse written in the sand. Maybe it's a secret message that he's leaving for me. But then it turns out that it, it may well have been Mr. Topes wrote it in there. And then that was all too much for her and she was crying. But um, it is what it is. I mean, it's an interesting play of characters. Uh, there's definitely a sense of um, sort of status there, wasn't there? Mrs. Topes was obviously a, quite a big character. She seemed to, um, what's the word? Uh, she seemed to dominate her husband and Barbara, but I mean, I'm chatting away, trying to make it better than it was. It wasn't very good, if I'm honest, and so I'm not reading anything tomorrow, and I'll be back on Thursday night, a bit earlier, for the story, Aldous Huxley's short story, The Little Mexican, which I think we can find some information about. I think it's one of his better-known stories, so Mr. Huxley has a lot of making up to do with the little Mexican, because I don't think me and Julie weren't impressed with um, the green tunnels, and I don't suppose many people were, but there we go, guys. You don't know until you've read it, and once you've read it, you can make up your opinion, 
and that's that. So yes, guys, thanks for sharing that with me anyway. <laughs> Apologies, but um, that's the way it goes, isn't it? And uh, we'll be back Thursday for the Little Mexican, hopefully more of a, a narrative arc and uh, some semblance of a storyline and an ending, but we don't know. Maybe not, but we'll find out Thursday night at 8 p.m., and then on Sunday, we'll have the big reading of uh, H.G. Wells' Food of the Gods. Um, um, and Julie asks a very good question. When will you be reading Ready Player Two? And I can't tell you when I'll be reading Ready Player Two. But what I'll do, let me tell you. Uh, Sunday night, I'll be reading H.G. Wells' Food of the Gods, like I say. And then that week... I'll be doing a big poll, and in that poll will be Ready Player Two, the first Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Rings, and two others. And so, yeah, if it wins, Julie, then I'll be reading it the Sunday after next. So it's going to be exciting to see, because the Fellowship of the Rings, Lord of the Rings, is very popular, but I think a lot of people enjoyed Ready Player One. So it's going to be a toss-up with them, and I haven't decided the other two that will make up the poll. But yes, next week they'll be in the poll, Julie. So yeah, who knows? Who knows? We'll find out soon enough. But guys, that's it for this evening. Have a great week. I'll be here on Thursday at 8, and then back Sunday for the, the, bigger, the bigger story, H.G. Wells. So thanks for being here. Apologies, the story wasn't too thrilling, but there you go. Can't have hits all the time. And I'll see you Thursday. Have a great week. And I'll see you soon. Bye, guys. See you.